growing consensus around the idea that search will change from a subset of online advertising to becoming a channel all on its own, finding and directing the process of content consumption and advertising delivery. We are very fortunate today to have a keynote speaker who knows a great deal about both content consumption and advertising delivery. He's one of the foremost observers of modern communications. He's a respected journalist, leading blogger, and the founder of a new type of media company that's based on a model of federating content from all types of providers. Soon after earning a bachelor's and a master's degree at UC Berkeley, just across the bay from here, John Bertel leaped into the biggest mega trend of the 90s as one of the founding editors of Wired Magazine. From there, he moved on to start the Industry Standard, another one of the most influential publications of the boom days of the internet bubble. In recent years, his fresh thinking and innovative ideas have been reaching a large audience with this very popular search blog, web blog, which covers search technology and media. In addition to his responsibilities as chairman and publisher of Federated Media Publishing, John's also written for Business 2.0, and he served as program chair for the Web 2.0 conference. Thank you. He's like, oh, there'll be 700 people here. Like, Thank God, no, I'm totally terrified. <laughs> Jesus. So you guys have been here for what, two, three days? I just found out that you have something called a post-conference session or something like that. It's 75 degrees today, and tomorrow's going to be 78, and the next day is 80. Sorry. <laughs> Go to the this beach. is a really nice place to be during post-conference session. <laughs> <laughs> so, I live here, of course. I went to school here. Why the hell am I here on this stage? That's what I want to get into, because I, I didn't think there were going to be this many people. Now I really have to justify my existence. So, I went to Berkeley. Can we go to Berkeley? Couple, three, go Bears, five and one. They're going to destroy Stanford in a few weeks. <laughs> After Berkeley, which I went to twice, I helped start this magazine, Wired. What? What? Now, here's where the first direct marketing reference comes in. You have to give me a break. My knowledge of direct marketing, I backed into through search. And before that, I was totally old school. When I joined Wired, I was very young, I didn't know much about business, and I was appalled at the amount of money we had to raise, not to pay all those people I wanted to have write for the magazine, but to pay for direct marketing. The average cost of an acquisition of a customer at Wired was $70 to start, and then it got up to 120 So, started Wired, and then in 1994, we started a company called Hotwire, which was taking advantage of this cool new technology called Mosaic, the browser. And we will take some credit, if not all, depending on who you talk to, for inventing the uh, uh, 480 by 60 banner, the, uh, you know, the one that we haven't gotten rid of yet. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we were trying to come up with a business model for paying all the writers at Hotwire. And uh, I remember Prodigy, that, uh, you know, it had this banner down at the bottom that wouldn't go away. It was really irritating. Prodigy was an early online service. And, and I used it, and, uh, and it irritated me. And we were in a editorial meeting, which is, of course, where we made all our business decisions. Um, and and we, well, how can we pay the writers? Like, well, you might know that banner and then Prodigy, why don't we do that? And then uh, our editor in chief and CEO said, hey, I got an idea. How about we take that, put it up at the top, so people can scroll it out of the way? <laughs> <laughs> that was how it was born. Um, so I left because I noticed that there was something going on with the internet and started a magazine called The Industry Standard because it seemed to me that there was a lack of realistic financial journalism covering this extraordinary uh, rise. Uh, and it seemed to me that it was going to change the entire business world. I had a 10-year plan for The Industry Standard, which was executed in a year and a half. Um, we sold 7,500 ad pages in one year. And we started, which is a record, by the way, I doubt that record's ever going to get beaten because of the state of the magazine industry currently. Um, and we started an online company called uh, thestandard.com. Now, this is very important. There will be a test in about a minute. Um, 
We got, after dumping $16 million into the standard.com, we got to half a million visitors. Something we were very, very proud of. Because most of our competitors had spent something like 20 to $50 million to build a website with that kind of traffic. We were very, very proud. So here we were with half a million visitors, 7,500 ad pages, and then everything blew up. <laughs> everything! It was awful. It was really... Well, anyway, so if you're sort of the poster child for the internet boom, and then the bust happens, what do you do when you're out of a job? Go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> Which is where I went. Uh, this time as a professor, you know, if you can't do, you should teach. So, um, <laughs> so I was teaching journalism, magazine development, and, and online uh, development, and I started teaching something uh, called blogging because I thought blogging was really interesting because we were taking the journalist and he was going direct to the audience. Um, and I started blogging myself. And when you're at Berkeley, of course, <laughs> that's, the, that's my blog right there, or a little piece of it. Um, I started it because I wanted some help from a community to uh, make me not as dumb as I obviously was on a subject I was fascinated with, which was search. So I figured I'd start this thing, call it search blog, because I'm a very original thinker. Um, and if a couple hundred people came and helped me sort of think out loud in public, maybe my book would be a little smarter. So that was the idea, and I started sort of, you know, writing up my interviews and thinking out loud about the implications of search and all that good stuff. Um, and the amazing thing was that within six months, I had 40,000 people visiting the site on a monthly basis. 40,000 people, which was a lot more people than I thought ever cared about search. So obviously, I, I, it seemed to me I was onto something. The book came out, that was great. I wrote that book called Search, available on Amazon. <clears throat> um, and about the same time, I noticed that there was, out of the ashes of this big explosion, I noticed that there were sort of these sprouts pushing through. Um, these little companies, these really interesting little companies that had different characteristics than anything I had noticed before in the bubble time, driven by people who were really passionate about what they were doing, and small teams and all sorts of interesting different kind of economic implications about that. And uh, I was meeting with a very, very smart man named Tim O'Reilly, and, and he said, I've got this idea for a conference uh, about all of this. And I said, absolutely, it sounds great, let's do it. So we started Web 2.0, the conference, um, without any idea that, the, that this name Web 2.0 would sort of turn into a whole newspaper industry of sorts. Um, <clears throat> but we started in 2003, and it, it was going great. And then with Tim, I helped uh, as a consultant him start a magazine called Make. Now, Make Magazine, was started with absolutely no direct marketing money. I'm sorry. Um, we launched it at, through online communities and the Amazon Direct channel. We spent zero money on customer acquisition in the business plan. And it was a huge hit. And so it was a real revelation for me. This was an idea I had because Tim said, I don't have $10 million to start a national magazine. Um, I'm not gonna, I just can't do it. And I said, how can we do this without, you know, the way we started Wired, the way we started the industry standard, which is, of course, you just you know, back up a dump truck of money pour it into that funnel of direct mail up here that goes down all the way to, you know, final conversion. Um, and so that was a really interesting experience in 2004. Now, in 2004, in the middle of 2004, a bunch of my pals have been blogging like mad at this site called Boing Boing. How many of you are familiar with Boing Boing? Come on, all you furry freaks out there, show yourselves there you are. They, they have very eclectic tastes, these guys at Boing Boing. And they just write about whatever sort of turns them on. There's four of them, and I kind of see them as a band. And, and they make this wonderful music, which is the website, Boing Boing. They called me up uh, in June of 2004, and they said, John, we have a problem. I said, what, what's going on? They said, well, our hosting bill is $500 a month. And last month it was 250 and next month it's going to be 750 or maybe even more. I said, well, what are you guys posting on your website? Like, video? You know, because bandwidth is actually quite cheap. Remember, this is post-crash. Bandwidth was almost free. I said, you must be having an amazing amount of traffic. And they said, yeah, yeah, we too. And I said, how many, how many visitors do you have? And they, and they said, half a million. Okay, remember the test? The industry standard, the standard.com, $16 million, half a million visitors. Boingboing.com, 500 bucks a month, half a million visitors. So it struck me that something was shifting a little bit in terms of how audiences were aggregated and acquired, right? The cost of acquiring that audience in the media world was shifting quite dramatically. 
So I started a company called Federated Media to take advantage of that, and maybe we'll get to it later if you guys don't kick me off stage. So, here's what I want to start with. The internet economy, there's sort of these three waves that have hit in terms of the narrative that I've been fascinated with my whole <coughs> career as a journalist. Um, the first, you're familiar with, let's digitize the back office. I remember my dad coming home with punch cards. He was not a computer programmer, but he was a financial controller. And so he had to become a Fortran programmer because all that back office stuff was getting stuck onto these massive computers, mainframes, and he had to understand it in order to do his job. Now, if you look at the graph, the amount of money being spent in the industry was pretty low. The number of people being touched by the technology, actually being touched like my dad, pretty low also. That was digitizing the back office. It had an interface. It was called the command line interface. Okay. Stay with me here, because now we get to digitize the front office. This is when all of us got the computer on our desk, remember, and it connected to the back office, and we got to crunch numbers and do reports, and that was really fun. Um, and it had an interface, right? Windows, or the Mac, which I'm a Mac guy. So. Um, and, and the number of people that were touched by this technology increased dramatically with the, with the rise of the Windows and the GUI interface. Um, and the desktop PC, and of course the size of the industry got much bigger in terms of, you know, uh, dollars in the economy. And companies like Apple and, 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 and Microsoft became huge. The next wave is the one we're right in the middle of right now, and that is when we digitize our customers, when we turn the guts of our business that's now been digitized back and front, inside out, and push it out into the world so that our customers can interact with us. That is many, 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 many more people being touched by technology, right? And much, much more money, okay? Um, that's what I call the internet economy when we started the standard, and it has an interface. Google. Search. That's my thesis, anyway. So let's look at the interfaces here. How many of you guys remember this? Okay. <laughs> look at you girls, you're such geeks. Well, I couldn't even deal with this interface, right? It's like D-I-R, right? Return. <laughs> so, okay. That's what you got, right? And then you had to do something else, like run EXE somewhere or other. I don't remember exactly, but this, this is what the DOS interface looked like, remember? Then we had the big revelation, the hunt and poke. Interface, right? Metaphorical. Oh, I got a desktop because it's sitting on a desk. So, really, you know, I'm on a desk. It desktop, you know, it crunch it into the computer, and that's what we got. And that was a huge leap forward, right? From the old interface to the new interface. We're still in it now, and the web is really initially a derivative of this interface. So let's think about search as the interface 1.0. That's pretty much where we are right now. Right? You've got a command line, just like C prompt, but instead of dir, you put in natural language. You put in words that mean something to you. That is a huge shift from a command language that is, that is written for computers to our language, natural language. That is a very big shift in computer interface. It's very significant. But still, when you press return, you get a list of results. So we are so early in the interface of what search is going to become. That's why I get so excited about it. And that wave is so much bigger, and the impact on all of us on culture is so much larger. It, it's kind of exciting. So where might we go? Well, a lot of researchers that I talked to for my book think that search is going to become kind of a navigational interface, not, not unlike a, a car steering wheel. You know, with all of its sort of, we get very used to it, but it becomes a way we steer our way through our life online. And when you think about it, the ability to stick a search box in front of anybody and they'll know how to use it contextually is a pretty big leap. Ten years ago, you couldn't have done that. So I want to give you one example of where search might go so you can start to think of it as an interface that might change dramatically from our command line right now. And this will be an example uh, <clears throat> from my book uh, about barring a bottle of wine. Let's say it's two or three years from now. We're not talking very far. You are in the heart of wine country. You're also in the heart of overcharging for wine country. Uh, as you may have noticed as you were going out to dinner uh, in the last few nights, um, 
So let's say uh, you're back at home, you have Whole Foods, right? Okay, so you're in a Whole Foods a couple years from now, so you're gonna do a big dinner for your boss is coming over, you're having a bunch of friends over, you wanna impress them. Um, your wine cellar is, is a little low, so you've got to get some wine as a long, along with your, you know, Nyman Ranch tri-tip and your organic broccoli rob and all that other good stuff. So you're, you're, you're at the wine aisle, right? <clears throat> and now the wine aisle at Whole Foods, right? Testament to hierarchy. 120 bucks, 80 bucks, 60 bucks, 40 bucks, and you never do this. Never do this at Whole Foods because that means you're cheap and everyone knows it. So, so you have got to be up here because this is a big dinner. Right? So you're up here checking this out and going, oh, I can't believe I have to do this. I'm going to get so ripped off. Here I am at Whole Foods and I don't even, oh, wait a minute. You've got your trio or your mobile phone or whatever it is. Let's pretend that's this because if I wore it, then the microphone gets screwed up. But, so you've got your phone. It's probably about this size by then. Um, and what you do is you take your bottle of wine and you're very confident now because you know you're about to take advantage of the new technologies that you have, you wand your phone over the label or over the product code, right? That creates a search instantaneously. Maybe it's Google Mobile, maybe it's Yahoo Mobile, maybe it's a company that started and it's gonna be sold for 1.65 billion next year, we don't know. <laughs> but you wand over instantaneously a search on your screen and it says, 2001 Stags Leap Merlot. Average price in your neighborhood, $45. Turn it over, $85. You're getting ripped off. But there's more. On your screen it says, just click here to pre-order and reserve a bottle in a store, you know, half a mile down the block. Click here to have it delivered to your house. Click here for reviews. Click here for what your friends think of the wine. Click here for, and you can imagine, and, 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 right? as Google or whoever organizes all the information available about this bottle of wine and it, its context in your life. Of course, the guy you know who runs Whole Foods wine aisle is now calling his manager and asking for a ban on cell phones, but uh, <clears throat> that's search, right there, that's search. <clears throat> now Web 2.0, which I think is the, the sort of has been driven by this search. Remember in the 90s we had this big battle between Microsoft and Netscape. And everyone thought it was all about controlling that window into the web called the browser. And Microsoft worked so hard to kill, which they did, Netscape, and to win the browser wars. Turns out we were paying attention to the wrong thing. I was covering this story at Wired, I was covering it at the Industry Standard. I was convinced it was all about the window because we all understand, of course, controlling the window, Windows, is how you control the computer, right? Turns out it didn't matter. What matters is what's inside the window. Because there isn't any controlling that on the internet. Anything can come through that window, and we hope that will always be the case. So a, pun a bunch of new startups started leveraging that fact, started offering things inside that window, started building businesses on top of the platform that is the web. So that's the first principle that um, Tim and I came up with when we started the Web Tool Conference and kind of outlined in a paper uh, what we thought the, uh, the framework was. The web is now a development platform, and that sounds really boring and geeky, except that we're not developing software code anymore. We're developing businesses. We're developing opportunities to interact with consumers. Um, we're, we're developing the economy. One of the most interesting phenomena of very successful companies in this space is that they develop something that we call the architecture of participation. This is now generally known as harnessing collective intelligence or user-generated content. Um, but the idea that you let your customers help you build your business, and a great example, of course, is Amazon, right? Um, people who bought this book also bought, right? Um, those recommendations are all by paying attention to where people are going and what they're buying and then surfacing it back up and using that information collectively, that collective intelligence, to drive more sales. Also, a lot of the companies, almost all of them that were starting in this Web 2.0 space, were very lightweight because they were borrowing from here or there, they were using open source software, the cost of computing, the cost of bandwidth were very, very low. Of course, the Boing Boing versus the Standard.com is a classic example of that in media. And they're innovating in assembly. They're innovating in how they bring things together. Um, that seemed to be where the value was being added now, not in sort of cornering off a market and defending it because you've got a monopoly, but rather innovating in how you brought commodity goods together. The, the sort of classic example of this in the 90s in the hardware business is Dell, right? Because 
you know, keyboards, monitors, CPUs, plastic boxes, mice. Not particularly, you know, anyone can get those. But how do you put them together? How do you innovate and assembly? On the web, that was happening in light speed. And then, of course, the long tail is a new book out by Chris Anderson, the current editor of Wired, about this phenomenon. But the ability to harvest profits in previously uneconomic areas because of the Internet's ability to reach very small markets, but lots and lots of them. The music business is the first kind of classic example of the long tail in action in terms of bands who previously could never get signed to a label, finding their bliss at, say, 10,000 fans. 10,000 albums would never get you signed to a major label, but if you can do it direct on the web, you can make a living. <clears throat> of course, my biggest web tool principle is search rules. No, not that search. This search. <laughs> that was a little Look. advertisement for my book. Did you notice that? <laughs> Um, search rules, Google and Yahoo uh, being the two largest uh, search, because Google keeps gaining share, it's extraordinary, uh, they just gained another point this week, uh, expense of AOL and Yahoo. But I think that Google, uh, search has become the driver of these kinds of businesses, and it's also our culture's point of inquiry, it's how we ask for things. It's that spade that we use to turn the soil. It's an artifact. As a matter of fact, I use anthropological terms to describe this idea of the database of intentions. Every search we make is recorded. The results are recorded. Where we go is recorded. And it's recorded to help you guys do your jobs in the future. As well as to help all those who report it make lots more money. As well as to allow lots of Congress folk um, reasons to get all in a kerfuffle over the next 10 years. As a matter of fact, the kerfuffle has started, you may recall, uh, the Department of Justice subpoenaed the entire Google Index uh, a couple of months ago, or a few, uh, in the spring. Um, and we wouldn't have known about that, by the way, if Google hadn't made uh, a, a, a sort of had a hissy fit about it. But enough about that. So it's a reality for all traditional forms of business. They have to deal with search now, and it's a reality for all forms of marketing. And let me explain why. First of all, you've probably all seen this. The cost of acquisition is extraordinarily low with search to the point where there is far too much demand for search than there is supply. Right? It works so well, I want to dump every dollar I can into it, except there's only so many people putting Chrysler Miniman into Google. You can't buy more of them. There's only so many. So once you get to that, you get to a market equilibrium for the cost of Chrysler Miniman. Direct mail, $70. This is this is uh, information from Piper. I was told by a friend who works in the Yellow Pages business that that number is off, and it's now $13, which means they're doing well. I think they incorporated their online costs into that number. But as you see right up here, at the place that's off the chart, is the cost for the industry standard direct marketing up there at 120 bucks. So um, I clearly wasn't doing something right there. Um, <clears throat> so here's the access point. This is the thing that got me all excited when I was writing my book, the point where the light bulb went off, um, if there is indeed such a point when you're writing. Uh, before search, marketers, particularly brand marketers, and you have to forgive me, this is the space that I spent more of my time in, used content as a proxy for audience. Right? Content was this packaged good and then you attach your message to the content. Right? Women, 20 to 34. Young mothers, I need to reach them, how can I do it? I'll attach my message to Oprah, that packaged good called the Oprah television show or the Oprah magazine, right? So I'll attach my marketing around my Chrysler minivan to content, content attached marketing. But after search, in, in search, audiences declare intent, then they go to the content. And there is this new attachment point the intent declaration point, which is an extraordinary moment. It's as if you can get your direct marketing message at the point an envelope is opened, you can change the message according to what you know about why they're opening the envelope. I mean, that's exciting. That changes things in a big way. It doesn't just change direct. It changes brand. It changes a lot of things because the customer now expects that, well, I've declared what I want and now I'm looking at where I think I might go and I'm going over here. I've just sort of declared everything you might need to know about me, so talk to me. So intent drives content, content disaggregates. It's not like, I'm interested in price or minivans, I think I'll go to minivansportal.com. No, I'm just gonna declare an intent and a portal will be assembled around me by Google. 
and then I'll go where I want to go. And by the time I get there, you guys better understand what I want, because I've just declared it. No, that's not really what they're thinking, but it is actually what they're thinking. Search has taught them to think that way. It is how we have a conversation with technology. So, intent becomes a proxy for the audience, and effectively, the marketing has to shift because of that. So search is driving audiences towards these places where they can have conversations. Social media sites, places where they can ask questions, places where they see other people asking questions about products and goods and services and so on. Consumers expect participants in this conversation, including the marketers, to understand who they are and why they're there. They don't expect it, you know, they expect it to sort of, like it's part of the air. There's a set of mores of, of, of cultural values that are starting to be expected on the web. And online marketing media can be driven more by permission, come on in and talk to me, and conversation, than by interruption and dictation, which is the model of the past hundred years. It had to be because we lived in a packaged goods society, right? But now we can live in a conversational one. So creative can invite that conversation. It doesn't demand attention. It says, hey, I see you're interested in the Christ for me, I got some minivans over here. You want to talk about them? Let me tell you about you know, why you might be interested in this. It's driven by attention, and it's driven by the consumer as opposed to those who control distribution. Now, there are these big factories of attention distribution. That's search, and, and, and to, to an extent, the portals as well. And I believe because people pick their content so directly now that it is once again king, and I'm going to say that because I'm the guy who makes content, of course, so pick that one apart. But the landing page is kind of queen, right? Where you go when someone says, I'm interested, is so important now, right? And I remember when we were doing all the direct marketing tests for all the, for the magazines that I helped start, I would get, you know, panels and panels and panels, and I was supposed to sit there and decide which one was right, because that's the one we were going to dump a ton of money into, and then we had our control, and then that didn't work, and $4 million later we tested again, and, you know. There are many great marketing campaigns that are impossible to link to because they're in Flash, for example. And if you can't link to them, no one can find them. And if no one can find them, and search can't find them, then you won't get the attention that you deserve. So conversation over dictation. Conversational media, especially things like blogs and community-driven sites, dig.com, for example, or YouTube, stuff like that, um, MySpace. Marketing media is driven more by permission to conversation, less by interruption. Um, and in conversational environments, marketing is an it's a, it's this opportunity to engage in this relevant dialogue. So, I was thinking about this. This is my totally cheesy moment of the speech. I figured I'd just lull you all to sleep and then give you a totally cheesy moment. I was thinking about this as I was preparing for this. So, I remember what I was told mattered in direct marketing when I was being schooled by all these direct marketers who were taking millions of dollars from our budget and, <laughs> and delivering me a $120 customer. They said, the most important thing, conversion. Conversion. Got to get it to open the envelope. That's important. But then you need them to fill the thing out and convert. And I now think this is the this is the tricky part. It's conversation. If you can get people into a conversation, you've got them. So it's not about converting, 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 and what panel tests best. But are you having a rich and healthy dialogue with the people who should be your customers? then you can convert them, right? So there's this online opportunity, you all probably know it quite well, but the promise of the web is to know what your customer wants before they even show up. When they show up, they come with all of this data that says, here's who I am and here's why I want to talk to you. And your ability to know all that and instantaneously create something that responds to them, right? Because it's supposed to ask them to respond to your one static message. So if you don't know, you can invite them to tell you. And then you can respond with content that honors what the customer is telling you. This is a new set of skills, and all of you are the ones who are going to figure out how to do this if you're not already. But we're talking about new tools, new approaches to research and planning, new thinking about how you buy media, new and very highly iterative creative. Now we're talking about 10 or 15 or 40 test panels, but 10,000 or 40,000 test panels, right? From the approach to the payoff after that envelope opening moment. Definitely new ways of measuring and, and, and calculating return on investment. And most importantly, it requires you to venture out from what you're comfortable with. There is nothing I, I mean, when I was trying to change the color from blue to red on some of these panels, it was like I was, you know, 
blaspheming the Bible. No, you have to understand, red converts at 0.0007% more than blue. And I'm like, okay, red. But I think now we need to try new things because there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of this stuff hasn't been figured out yet. So, the customer is now in control. This is an old saw, but it's very, very true online. <laughs> How would we apply this? It's very simple, just turn everything over to them, right? Piece of cake, right? Let them run your brand, let them interact with all your campaigns and tell you what to do. But it's really not that simple. I built a company and I want to give you a couple of examples of the stuff we've been doing. It's not directly direct, but as I hope to get to toward the end, um, which we're getting to, um, it's, uh, it might be relevant. So. The architecture of participation. Remember that Web 2.0 principle, let your customers help you build your business? So how about in the marketing, you employ the customers to help you build your marketing, help you build what your brand might be, help you actually build your next set of your products, for example, and criticize them openly and take it. Stand there and take it. That is the hardest thing in the world to do, but it's the coolest thing when you watch a company respond to criticism and get stronger for it, and get credit in the community for actually listening, as opposed to dictating. Now here's the first example, this is the first thing we did a year and a half ago, we were launching the company, and the folks at Ogilvy were so cool to work with us on Lenovo, and they said, wait, we really we want some, you know, we want to take this Lenovo brand and, and tell people it's cool, don't worry about the fact that, you know, that a Chinese company bought it, it's going to be great, you know, we're not abandoning the IBM, you know, sort of steadfast, stoic, don't worry, it'll always work. We want to tell them everything's going to be great. Um, and I said, well, how about you let all the customers that, that, you know, that we represent, all the blogs, the readers of the blogs, help you design the next version of the Lenovo ThinkPad? How about we just let them tell you what, the, what you want? Wouldn't that be cool? And they're like, oh my goodness, that's an interesting idea. And they went back to the client, the client said, Eh, not so much. Um, and so, but the agency was really persistent, and what they ended up doing, it was a tub in the water, but it was a start, is they let the customers decide whether the next model would be titanium or black. So, it's a start. Um, titanium uh, won, by the way, and of course, like any good marketer, they made both colors anyway. Because, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it's like 40% wanted black, what are you going to do, not give them black, right? Um, now here's another really interesting case study, Microsoft. Now Microsoft, I've worked with Microsoft for 15 or 20 years. It took us three years of work to get Microsoft in. It took us a year and a half the standard to get Microsoft in. It was like up to Seattle, back down, up to Seattle, back down. They always say no, no, no. You're not big enough, your audience isn't influential enough, come back when you have your numbers, all that good stuff. Within a couple of months, Microsoft started to work with us. And <clears throat> they ran those dinosaur ads. You know the ones with the you guys know the dinosaur ads where the guys are walking around with the dinosaur heads and, and, and Microsoft is saying, have you upgraded to Office 6 point whatever yet? If not, you're a dinosaur, which I always think is the way to market to your clients, of course, tell them they're dinosaurs. But they said they had the best recall of any campaign they've ever done. I'm like, hey, you're calling them dinosaurs. So they bought that ad and they bought out four or five of our sites, very influential authors who write about technology subjects like Wi-Fi. You know, Wi-Fi networking, for example, or this guy who writes about search, uh, search blog or something like that. And they bought it out, and, and they ran one set of creatives, just the dinosaurs, you know, the dinosaurs walking around and, you know, interacting in office scenes, right? And after about, oh, six or seven times through as a reader of the site, you start to get a little tired of the dinosaurs. Um, and we fed that back to the, uh, to the agency. We said, you know what, the, the authors were really kind of a little um, upset with the dinosaur ads. Do you have any new creative? Because in the web, the conversation's always happening, and you need a call and response, and, and this is just call, 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 it's the same, over and over. And the agency listened, they said, well, hmm, what, what do you think we should do? I said, do you have any new creative? And they said, no, we, we, we didn't think to make more than one flight of creative. And, uh, and our VP of Revenue, a really smart guy, said, hey, I was talking to these authors, and they said, did you know that Microsoft Office has all this Wi-Fi aware technology and all this stuff? I didn't know about it. This is why it runs so slow, because it's all the stuff you don't know about that is in there, right? And did you know it had this and had that and had this and had that? And, and the author suggested, why don't you guys say that on my site? Since my site's about Wi-Fi, why don't you talk about Wi-Fi in the ad? And they said, okay. 
And so they, they actually listened to the author and actually let the author suggest copy for the final frame of the ad. And then they ran a test with the two ads side by side. And the author-driven copy performed 60% better. So getting the authors into the conversation was a big leap forward towards performance. Of course, they didn't change the landing page, but it was just a test. Um, next time they will. Symantec, another conversational marketing example. They bought the media to drive interest into their own blog where they were talking about the issues that affect security, right? And on the blog, they didn't just sort of have this cultifying, loyal, legal, you know, approved, boring marketees. They actually said, hey, you know what, guys? We're going to admit it. The Mac operating system, not many viruses. We don't really have too much of a product there because you know there aren't there aren't that many things to, to protect against right now. That might change, and we're always being vigilant and watching that. But just so you know, and the partners couldn't believe the honesty, and they they dug it. Dig is a, a, a very popular technology website that covers news and now covering lots of other things too. Um, and it got dug, and the blog got linked to tons and tons of times. And of course, that drove the blog up to the top of the search results, and Symantec became sort of the talk of the technology nation, which is what Symantec wanted to be. And now, Symantec is buying media units that are simply an RSS feed of their blog in the media unit. So they're actually making the, the ad what they're talking about on their blog, which is really cool. Another example is Cisco. They just started this campaign last week. They invited a bunch of different authors. The conversation was feeding through the advertiser, the author, and the audience. So that was an interesting conversational marketing. And this is my favorite, dice. Okay, how many of you guys know IT guys or gals? IT, you know, people who run IT in your work. Are they happy? <laughs> okay. We know that IT guys generally like to grump and sort of sneer at you and say you're kind of dumb and, you know, don't you realize the command shift return four does this and God, right? And generally always think that they, you know, people don't appreciate them and so on. Now, DICE is a job board for IT, right? And they had this great idea. Why don't we make our banner a place where we can have a conversation? Why don't we invite all these grumpy IT people to complain about their jobs? So when you go into the banner, literally into that little white space there, you see a flow of people complaining about their jobs who are having a conversation through the banner with each other. I mean, how cool is that? That's just a great idea in terms of the use of media. And the interaction is seven minutes and 41 seconds on average for people who go into that banner, which is far longer than anyone spends on any technology website, I can tell you. So they literally hijacked the audience. Now, the next time these people think about getting a job, where are they going to go? They're going to go to Dice, right? And they're always thinking about getting another job, from what I can tell. <laughs> so, about FM. How to support independent authors like the ones I was just describing, and how do you market in conversational media like this if you're a marketer to any kind of scale, and how do you ensure there's quality when you bring these sites together? That was the sort of insight that led to FM. It was not an ad for FM, or maybe it is a little bit, but we brought all these sites together. We have about 90, 95 now in different federations like technology and automobiles and parenting, and we just announced sports and, and lots of others. And we bring a critical mass together and ensure that this conversation occurs. And I believe this conversation is actually going to shift both from brand and direct. These are a few of the folks that are working with us now. And here's a couple of closing thoughts. Often, I think, direct is this law of large numbers game. You know, huge numbers at the top of the funnel and then those precious, converge, precious conversions, in my case, are 120 bucks down at the bottom. But online, that really ignores the conversation. I have done, had a lot of conversations with direct marketers in the last year in the course of doing Federated, and they say, I'm sorry, but we have our conversion metrics, and if you don't convert at 67 cents CPC, we're not interested. So you can, and the reason is, of course, because it costs you nothing to just flood the market and work just from the CPC back end. But that ignores what it does to the brand, and it ignores what people think about you when you just Yank, yelling, 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 yelling until no one listens to you anymore, right? Just like what happened with Microsoft before they changed to author-driven copy. So online, there are these wonderful new tools to discover those unique souls who will convert. And search is certainly one, but you can learn a lot from brand advertising, I think, and from behavioral, which is starting to make a very important comeback because the data now is understood. And you can start to learn what the baggage is that people carry as they walk around the web. Now, this is a very important issue of policy and privacy, which is not entirely sorted out. Uh, but as we were discussing beforehand, 
you guys need to lead on this, because if you don't, then someone else is, and they're probably going to have an address in Washington, D.C. So, my gut tells me that these two, direct and brand, are really merging into a hybrid that promises to become an entirely new discipline, and all of you in the room get to lead that, which is extremely exciting. So you're all in a pretty cool industry, and please enjoy the weather over the next few days, and thank you very much for having me. That was an absolutely terrific, thought-provoking presentation, and, and he was afraid he was going to speak to an empty room because it's the last day of the conference.